So I'm a professor at this university, and usually the setting is very different. You are the odd people, and I'm the right person, because I usually teach, and you listen, and I know the, the thing I teach. I think now it's very different. I'm the odd person, and you're more the expert. And I'm, so it's, I took this as a challenge. I'm, I'm an academic person. We try to commercialize our methods, but it's very challenging. We look into commercialization, actually, thanks to uh, the European Research Council. Uh, but what we do, we do theory, okay? Computer-supported theory development for improving, actually, not just system security and privacy, but in general, rigorous system engineering. So let me just, I would just like to know, like, how many of you are affiliated in any form to Teuvin? So students, researchers, okay. So it's not that, I mean, I thought actually it would be more. I know that some of you might have courses with me. Uh, but it's, no, it's, yeah, no, there's no issue. That's it. I'm the odd person, you're the right person. So what is this automated reasoning about? And actually automated reasoning now is becoming more and more, you, I will tell you some stories where it is used and it's now really becoming in software development as like the backbone of software development. And in a very vague sense, what we do in automated reasoning, we just think like we are automating a mathematician or we are automating a computer scientist in the way that you're given an input problem and we make a so-called mathematical and logical abstraction. So we represent the problem as a mathematical statement. And then we use what we actually want to do. We don't want to use that. Math so when we have this mathematical statement, we cannot do it anymore manually. We cannot analyze it manually because that statement is huge. So what we try to do, we try to develop computer-supported tools to automate the analysis of this mathematical statement in order to show that it's true. It's very similar what we do in math. In math, you're proving theorems, so we do very similar things in automated reasoning. Except that our theorems are not, for instance, Pythagoras' theorem, but our theorem would say that given a software problem, it is correct. So it's error-free, for instance. So how does it go and what actually we do at Teuvin? So basically, we use automated reasoning to ensure our, so my, most of my work so far was really about safety analysis of software, so ensuring that software or classes of software programs are error-free. And then we automated methods for generating program properties that would allow automated verification of the software. We do tower synthesis, that is, if you're given a specification, we synthesize a code that is correct with respect to the specification, and many other things. And Basically, just about like one and a, one, a, one and a half year ago, we look, started to look into software sec, uh, in system security. So, what what are these challenges in system security that are really hard for existing approaches, and can we use automated reasoning approaches there? And just to grant, so this is the research grant that we have. So, it's mainly funded by the European Research Council. Uh, but I also have a, a, a similar Swedish grant from the Wallenberg Academy and then the Austrian FWF funding and the Vienna Research Funding Agency, VVTF. And now I'm academic, but it doesn't mean that I just, I, I don't talk to industry. So actually our group is really working together with industry. So we get our use cases or benchmarks from industry. And in this respect, we mainly work with three companies from Amazon Web Services. So there's an automated reasoning group in Amazon Web Services, which actually uses I will show you what, but it, it uses some of our products for validated network topologies. We are working with Microsoft Research in Redmond, also developing, well, actually Microsoft Research is now using automated reasoning to uh, test its Azure network. And very recently, really thanks to the, the emerging need of, of automated reasoning and system security, we started to work with a, a, a startup uh, it's called Certora in Tel Aviv, which is basically what it does, it provi provides rigorous cert certificates for audits. It's really a smart contract, like, I mean, there's many startups in, in the smart contract field. But just to make it right, okay, so what, what we or my, my group is doing, we are really at the end, okay? So there are many things in the pipeline until you can use us. And this many things, without these many things, such as testing, static analysis, debugging, we would be unable to be used. We are quite expensive. We will show that the methods that we are developing are in logic so-called undecidable, so we have no perfect solution, but we can actually scale. So let me just start, you know, the story, okay? So how, what it is about. And I will start the story from an easy perspective because just ensuring that the software is error-free 
is even longer there. I mean, this was, it's there since software appeared, even from the Turing machine. So this is actually a screenshot, a, a snapshot of, of, of uh, partial code of our own automated reasoner. So now if I would zoom in here, you would see C++ code. So we do develop also our methods, and it's, our method is developed in the so-called vampire theory improver. It's not big. I mean, you saw this, the lines before, the numbers before. Our is about 200 lines of C++ code. But it's kind of a medium software. And now imagine, so what, what does it mean to apply automated reasoning in, in software? Like, how, what does it mean to be error? Like, one aspect would be, can you show that your software is correct? Or some parts of your software is correct, or some parts of your software is error-free? And if you make changes to that part of the software, you maintain that your software is going to be error-free as well. So let me just uh, exemplify two very simple fragments, or very simple uh, uh, examples. And I mean, those of you who had software engineering in your uh, education would be very easy for you. But as simple as it looks like, OK, so here's, for instance, one piece of code. And think of this, basically what this piece of code is doing. You're taking your memory A, and you partition it. Positive elements could, do, could do, uh, go to the uh, memory B. And negative elements go to array C. Okay. And my question, is this software correct? So is this piece of code correct? And I just thought, like, I don't know. I and mean, actually, you're completely right, because I, I just told you the specification that what it should be, but there is no spec here. So one aspect of my research is that given such, I mean, even more complicated code, what kind of properties this software should respect even independently of the specification? And one property of this particular piece of code would be that every element in B, an array B, is a positive element from A. And now here's the challenge, so it sounds as easy in natural English, but if you want to write down and you want to formalize this property, you have to say that every element in array B comes from some element in array A. And now I will show you quite an ugly formula. This is how it would look like. It will be a safety property, what we say is safety property, which actually uses alternations of quantifiers. So again, there were people who had a bit of formal, log formal background, or at least you had TIL, so technician informatic and logic, you should be at least familiar with for all and exist. The bottleneck, that whenever you see this, so if you, have, you, have, if you are a non-expert in logic, you see such a formula, you just drop it, and you just try to get around it without even seeing it. So what we try to do in our work is, uh, is we, don't get a, we don't drop it. We actually generate and we automate the reasoning with such properties so you don't have to come up with such properties yourself. So one additional challenge when you do, I mean, there are many challenges in software verification, but one is that, for instance, in this particular piece of code, there is some function h. We can think it's an uninterpreted function, but let me just reveal one possible implementation of this function, which is just pointed to some other parts of the code. And it's, again, a very simple piece of code. The names are quite intuitive, so maybe you can guess what it's about. What does it compute? Yeah, so it's a Fibonacci sequence, and from math, you, we all know. I mean, I think this is not even, uh, you don't need a PhD for that. So it's basically computing one, so 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. So it's a well-known Fibonacci sequence, one of the most famous sequences of, of discrete math. And now here's the thing. So you all know what Fibonacci sequences are, but I'm interested, is this really doing it? Is it really computing? You can, of course, test it. You can enumerate after a particular bound. But what is the specification of Fibonacci numbers? that would ensure you that if you write a different program, with that specification, you should meet it. And it's actually not that trivial. We didn't expect it, but uh, we can actually show it. Here's a property. So basically, Fibonacci numbers uh, satisfy a polynomial of the gray force. So it would be unable for, I mean, it would be very hard for humans. I'm not saying unable, but it would be very hard for humans to automatically come up with such a properties in, in less, less than a second. So this would be, again, like one safety property that you can use, okay, so if I, this would be the specification of writing a correct Fibonacci number uh, implementation. So this is what we did so far, okay? So basically what we do in our research, we try to analyze the logically complex part of the code, and one such, code, uh, uh, one such part comes from the presence of loops or recursion, and this is actually what my work is about. Giving recursive, or, uh, recursive programs or, loop, uh, or program loops, try to generate properties ensuring correctness of the loop. 
So we both generate and also ensure the uh, safety properties of the loop. So this is where we were about, about in, around in 2017 or 2016 when I joined Teuvin. And at the time when I was joined Teuvin, a bit later, like half a year later, there was another professor joining Teuvin, Professor Matteo Maffei, who was really working on system security, trying to apply existing formal methods for proving system security. And there were many challenging applications he was telling me. And then we started to look into one, and then many, of course, many emerged. And here's one thing. So the idea was, can we use existing technologies from safety, automated reasoning for safety properties by adapting it to generate and ensure security and privacy properties? So what kind of security and privacy properties can you do? And here's a, one of, I mean, it's a very easy example. It's totally abstracted away from its complicated behavior. But think now, here you have an array A. And think now, now this array is basically your bitwise representation of a secret key. And then our encryption algorithm would come in. Why you need this so-called Hemming weight? Because you start counting the number of ones in that particular key. So, and the question is, okay, so now, is this, so can it, under which assumption, or what kind of minimal requirements can you show that your, this hemming weight is not leaked? And this, for instance, can be used in applications of measuring side, side channel leakage. So when we first, for, when we started formulating this problem, so, frankly speaking, I didn't understand what does it mean? What can it be used? But then there is, a, there is a seminal work in like more than 10 years ago, which is really a so-called relational verification. So how many of you heard of relational verification? Wow, okay. So maybe you should attend the course of formal methods for system security by, by uh, Matteo Maffei. So the idea of relational verification, it's not like it's not, you know, the big solution. It just solves some of the problems that it solves them quite efficiently for those kinds of problems. So in order to reason about, can it be that you start leaking this Hemming weight? The idea is that, try to, so try to observe all possible behavior of your input and make sure that no matter what input you take, this program is going to compute the same output. Okay, so you take multiple runs of the same program and you take different inputs to the same program and you see whether the output is the same. If the output is the same, but we would say it's a relational property because on different runs of the program, you can ensure you get the same output. And therefore, it should be not leaked on different runs of the program. So what we actually showed, that in one particular example, for this particular example, you can do that no matter what permutation of the array A you take, after executing this program, different runs, you would get the same Hemming weight. So it's not leaked. But of course, this is just for these particular classes of, of possible input uh, scenarios. And here's the idea of relational verification. You can take finitely many runs, or arbitrarily many runs of the program. It's enough to do it for two. And that is what is people were saying, you do two safety. The classical setting of formal verification would be one safety. Now you go for two safety because you take two runs of the program, the same program. And now you take two different inputs. So for this, red, uh, so for this part of the run of the program, I take an input array A, and here I take a variation of my input. And the only variation I do here is that I just do a swap. So I swap two elements, okay? That's the only difference between these two programs. Actually, the two programs are the same here, but the inputs are, uh, are different, and still I want to be sure that at the end of this program, I compute the same Hemming weight. So the number of ones of your secret key remains the same no matter how you swap your input. So how would you do that? How would you actually now prove this, okay? Knowing that this input only, these two inputs only differ by this one particular swap, after the execution of these two programs, the Hemming weights are the same. So this is what I want to prove. The Hemming weight on a red program is the same as the Hemming weight of the blue program. So any idea how would you do that? It took us actually quite, I mean, we had the idea, but it was, it was very hard to do anything with that idea. And the idea actually comes from one of the most hated subjects of computer science, because it involves induction. 
And this is from my experience also as teaching for, uh, logic or computer science in various universities. Induction is one of the hardest topics in undergrad education. But there is no way out. You don't know what, how big your array is. Okay? It's arbitrarily big. You only know that there, there, there is one swap position. But what you know after this particular swap position, the elements are piecewise equal. So what you need to do in order to show that the two computed Hamming weights are the same, you show that by induction, actually, you show that since elements are equal, if you sum up equal elements, you get an equal object. So if I start summing up the red portion and I sum up the blue portion, they are the same because they are piecewise equal. But for that, you would need induction. Now, assuming you have the induction proof there, then it starts the swapping. So you have, you have to have a different reasoning for the swapped position. And there, all you need is just commutativity of addition. So if I, swap, if I add up two elements that are swap of each other, they, their sum will be equal. And then you do one more induction step. And with that, actually, if you manage to automate, so if you manage to find out at which position this array swap happened, and if you manage to automate two induction steps, you're done. You proved that the two Hamming weights are equal. Now, similar reasoning can be, so actually we applied similar reasoning for non-interference properties, sensitivity properties. But automating this reasoning just brings, us really, brings us nice challenges for, for automated reasoning. First, you, I mean, what it comes here, you have to start reasoning about first or the data structures. You have to reason about integers or reals. You might want to use natural numbers or so-called term algebras, which are recursively defined data types. There were arrays you have to reason about, unbounded size of an array. Uh, totally unexplored problem. Induction. Induction is not even a first order property. And from all, I mean, from all your experience, I think as, a, as, a, as an undergrad or, or familiar with some kind of logic, first order logic is already hard. And now I put your induction there, which is not even expressible in first order logic. So what do you do with that? And the other one, which actually comes from more application of smart contracts, is that usually when you start doing security analysis, you have all these so-called aggregates. You start reasoning about sum of an object or a minimum in an object or a maximum in an object. And this aggregate, what it's called, but this, just think in terms of sum or min or max, they are also not first order quantifier. So you, you don't like first order logic. I do, but you, my, you might not like it. And now I tell you, okay, I solve your problem by introducing even features that are not even expressible in first order logic. So what can it be done? Like, what, how can we solve these reasoning challenges? And just, just to to get the picture, okay, what is, the, what is out there? What is the state of the art in automated reasoning? So one, if you have propositional formula, this is the easiest setting, okay? When you only have bits, zero and ones, mainly using hardware verification. I mean, I'm not saying this is easy, but it's at least, it's so-called decidable. You can always hope for a yes and no answer from an automated reasoner by, calling so, by using so-called SAT solvers. And there are quite nice examples, the solvers out there, such as Minisat or Lingaling. Actually, Lingaling is developed in Linz. And they already made an impact in industry. They, have, they are and they have been and are actually used at Intel for hardware verification. And some people in the audience worked on that. Now, when you go to software, zero and ones is not any more sufficient. You need a bit more. You have different kind of theories. You have integers. You want to express properties of arithmetic, for instance. And for those kind of problems, what the, what the state of the art is, you use so-called SMT solvers, so satisfiability model of theory solvers. Examples of that is CVC4, for instance, or Z3 developed at Microsoft Research, and they are also have already an impact because they are daily used at Microsoft Research or Amazon Web Services. And then you have the so-called theory improvers, which actually support full first-order logic with some restricted theory reasoning. So they know about zero and ones, but they might not know about arithmetic. And examples of provers are such as Vampire or E. And uh, the impact is, so again, it's used in Intel, and it's used at Amazon Web Services already. 
So this is, this is here first of, the theory, first of the logic. And then if you go beyond, they use, use so-called proof assistance, where it requires a lot of interaction between the user and the solver, which means you start working with higher order logic, second order, third order, and, and above. So you can express induction. And existing solvers are Isabel and Koch, for instance, and they are actually turns out to be quite useful. Surprisingly, they are used at Apple. And the nice thing why it's nice for us, because Isabel is a higher order theory improver. How it solves the problem, does the higher order de reasoning by trying to project down to first order. And when you have a first, when, when, when they are in a first order setting, they would use a first order theory improver. So what we are doing, okay, how we tackle all this big zoo of automated reasoners that we, we go for first of the reasoning. So we go for really for all exist quantifiers, extend that with theories. We have our own uh, prover, vampire, and um, it's actually used in industry. Surprisingly, you might think an academic tool to be used at the industry. So, you know, just to get, like, to be a bit of propaganda, so what is really vampire? It's, they told you it's a first order theory improvement, it's automated, which means if, you know, if you started the proof attempt, there is no interaction. You, you know, the, the prover does what the prover thinks is the best to be done, and you can only interrupt the process by pressing Control C on your terminal or maybe hoping that the prover is going to find your solution. I mean, we are developing, we are participating in all kinds of competitions in this area. There are competitions just like in Olympiads of first of the theory improvers. So we are, we are kind of winning those, those competitions. Um, it's free for academic use. You can go and, if you want, download and try it out. But what is important, just to summarize, what is the key features of Vampire and why it makes it suitable for, for, applying, out, for applying to automate proofs in application of system engineering is that it's not that you just get so, the question is this pr property true? And your property can be a security property, can be a safety property, can be a liveness property, or any other property. Of course, the entire problem is undecidable, so there will be no solution. There are many cases in which you cannot use Vampire, and there are many cases in which you cannot use a SAT solver, and so on. There is no unique solution, but we try to complement existing solutions. We actually, compete and, and basically work together with SMT solvers. What we say is saturation-based, and I will just explain this, what it means, okay, just to get the, the idea of what saturation-based theory improver is doing, but just like any solver, it's working the best if, it's, if, you, if you allow it to use a lot of strategies. So it's portfolio-based. We have plenty of strategies, like 50-plus strategies, and we train our solver always on a big data set trying to understand what is the best strategy to be used depending on the input syntax of your problem. And we have many extra features that actually allow to reason about induction, allow to reason about the theories, allow to reason about some aggregates. So when we did this work, so when this is kind of a state of the art in automated reasoning, and we applied this state of the art with extensions to relational verification for security, and then we just, you know, we got all kinds of examples from the academic uh, community, in information, from information flow, so non-interference sensitivity properties. And we just run Vampire against the leading, leading solvers, which is CVC4 and Z3. And surprisingly, only in this very small set of examples, we actually managed to prove 25 unique problems that were not proved before. Now, of course, you as a developer, so this is academic benchmarks, which means these benchmarks are already, so these benchmarks already contain only the logically complex part of the code. And of course, the, the code itself is much bigger. So how you find this logically complex part of the code, this is a challenging part of its own. But you can use, I mean, whoever, whatever, apply, whatever method you can apply, you can identify some portions on which, let's say, logical reasoning is useful, then you can use existing technology. So to, to kind of just, I would like to show you a demo, okay, how fragile we are. Because maybe now you might think from this experiment while we are solving you the, it's like, you know, I present you black magic and, and we solve all kinds of problems. It's not actually. It's really hard to understand what kind of problems can we solve. And we are not unique, I mean, we are unique in this setting, okay, but I think it's really, you need to use a zoo of many automated reasoners in order to make 
software development more secure. It's not just one method. So the bottleneck, what we do in automated reasoning, and it is not just vampires, any automated reasoner would do a very similar thing. As I told you, an automated reasoner would automate a mathematician, tries to automate a mathematician, and tries to automate as much creativity of human thinking as possible. But it, it does not replace a human. And what mathematicians like to do, when I give them a problem, so if, 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 if I'm also a mathematician myself, so when I'm given a problem, what I learned in my undergrad, the, the one of the favorite proof technical mathematician assume negation, assume the contradiction, and prove the contradiction. And that's exactly what we do, or what an automated reasoner does. We do so-called proof by refutation. So I give you some assumptions, and I give a goal, negate the goal, and try to establish the contradiction. So contradiction in computational logic is refutation. And let me tell you how this works, okay? So here's your search space. Initially, you take your input problem, you edit it, so the computer, the automated reasoner takes it and just creates a search space containing all these properties. And now the reasoning starts to work. And this is, I'll just explain you briefly what saturation means. I pick a clause, so I, I, pick, a, I pick a formula from my search space, and I match this clause, or this formula, against candidate clauses. I put them together, and I derive new clauses or new formulas. Most likely, these new formulas were not yet present in your search space. So then you put these children back in your search space. Your search space is going to grow, and then you reiterate the process. You again pick up an arbitrary formula from your search space, match it against possible other formulas, derive new consequences or derive new formulas, put the children back in your search, and your search space grows again. Okay, and here's the issue, because it grows actually very fast. It grows so fast that you're going to hit your memory, and then you get time out. So it's a problem of automated reasoning. It's, it's great in theory, it's hard to make it work in practice. So what it can happen in, in practice, okay? Ideally, the, you are always, we are always aiming in one of the two cases. You, you wanna find the proof. And if you found the proof, you even report the proof. You know that in this case, your input is valid. It might be that this process that I just showed you before will never terminate. So actually will terminate without ever finding a proof. In that case, you're done. It's not true. But in practice, what it happens, you just run the prover or the reasoner, and you just, you're running out of time and your memory, and you just report unknown, and you didn't solve anything. So the challenge is, okay, how to solve the unknown? And even in these cases, in which we already have a solution, can you actually improve performance? Because there's a huge difference if you solve in 20 seconds or if you solve in one second. So that's our challenge, okay? And this, is, this, uh, this challenge is going to remain. Whatever we do in automated reasoning, it's going to be there. And the nice thing, okay, so how we attack this problem, so what is our recipe? It's, our recipe it actually doesn't even come from computer science. So how you make automated reasoning scalable, let's put it this way. So the, the recipe comes from here, okay? You try, you fail, and you try again. You try to learn, you learn from failures, and run again, and run again, and run again. Hopefully you get approved, but there is no guarantee you get approved. So I actually had a, prepared a demo, but let me just read, run the, the uh, demo live, okay? And um, I'm just, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, yes, this is, uh, how do I get that? So let me just show you how fragile we are, okay? Because it's not like we are, like we can solve everything. Actually, we can solve very little things. But those are already good enough for some applications. So, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm using actually, um, okay. so I'm just running Vampire on a version of the Hemingway example. And I'm giving it, I'm using in some, I use some uh, two strategies just to make it show that how fragile we are with respect to proof strategy, or with respect to options. And I give 20 second time limit. Okay, and I just, let's just see what it does. Okay, so it's running, it generates, it generates all these children that you saw on the slides, okay? It generates quite many children in 20 seconds. And now actually, what says here, refutation, which basically says, okay, I proved it. Okay, the property is true. So the Hemingways are equal. 
Uh, but in 20 seconds, in order to find the proof in 20 seconds, it generated about one, so 150,000 formulas. And I don't think any mathematician would be able to generate 150,000 different, for, 150, different formulas <clears throat> in 20 seconds. But now, of course, you might think, but, but uh, I don't like 20 seconds proof. I don't have this time, okay? Actually, it said that I, uh, it generated a proof in eight seconds. So what I will do now, I will trigger, I mean, I will run the same cocktail of strategies, but this cocktail of strategies, is, it's fragile with respect to the time. So I now tell the prover, now I only gave you eight time, eight second time. Can you find a proof? And you know, you run it again, and the proof is there. So it's still the termination why it terminated. It's not because timeout proof was found, but now the proof was found in three seconds, and now even the search space went down from 150,000 clauses to 82,000 clauses. So basically half of the clauses, which does make sense if it's possible to find the proof in a short time. Go for that. That's the idea, and very similar to what a mathematician would do. You might, as you say, might say, I don't like three seconds. Can you go below? I just go two seconds. And it still found the proof. And now actually with 1.1 1 .1 second. And then, I mean, you can of course play with the limit. How far can you go? I just give one second. And then you have a proof in one second. Now actually, no, here now it doesn't found the proof. So there, we can see how far can you go. And now it found a second. So it's, there is a lot of non-determinism going on. It's very fragile to the time limit. And of course, you might ask, what, what is the best time to use? And we go for the fastest proof. We don't care of whether you have a short or a long proof. Whatever proof comes first, that's the solution. We don't start comparing proof. And again, if you just think in terms of undergrad experience, and I know it's from exams, sometimes the solution you get is the longest possible solution. Coming up with easy, very short proof, it's very hard. It requires a lot of knowledge. Sometimes you try many things, and for some reason you, you succeed, and that's the proof you report. And that's exactly what's happening here. So, you know, I would just conclude, and I mean, I hope I kind of raise your awareness that there is a possibility to use expensive methods for privacy. Um, <coughs> so we are not cheap. That's a problem. So we are good in terms of small examples. We are actually quite good also in big examples, but you have to make these big examples so that they really are big, so they are small in the even bigger code. Okay, how you find that that's the challenge of entire aspect. How, what kind of other techniques from static analysis, model checking, relational verification you use on top of it. But what it turns out, okay, so you, heard, you already heard quite many bugs in the morning. Or before me, and I mean, there are plenty of bugs out there. I mean, I think every day there is at least one software error report. And the, the, for some reason, I mean, understandably, even the bigger, com the bigger the company is, the more bugs will happen, okay? So basically, the, the, even the high-tech giants actually now investing a lot in automated reasoning. Amazon Web Services, since 2017, has this automated reasoning group. Microsoft Research is doing automated reasoning. Uh, that a startup companies such as Sertora are implementing automated reasoning methods to, to, to prove correctness of smart contracts. Facebook bought a company in 2014 called Monoidix, which was an automated reasoning tool, and now it has its own tool called Infer, which it's used on everyday development. And these are just you know, four examples which companies that we work together, but the, I think the, the list is quite long. But the, the challenge is, okay, so we develop these methods as, a, as theoreticians or academicians. You develop a nice method, you want to see, does it work in practice? You will try to scale it. And then you want to ship it. You want to you make software developers using your method, and that's the big challenge. The issue is, you know, you have the automated reasoning there, and the users will not really understand what automated reasoners can do. And Actually, they have very elementary uh, 
knowledge in logic. I mean, I, we can change the culture, we can try to change the culture, university try to do that, but I think it will remain that users will still not have the expertise that the developers or, of automated reasoners have. So you heard in the morning, okay, that security cannot be handled by engineers only. I fully agree. But it also has to be clear that security cannot be handled by ex experts only. So when it comes to changing the culture, it should be this culture of trying experts, showing their methods more towards engineers, and engineers coming back immediately with their feedback, what should be improved in terms of developers of auto in terms of for, uh, developing automated reasoners. And in some respect, this is a success, in my opinion, why Infer at Facebook it's used, is so successful. Because they have this, which you also heard in the previous talk, you heard, it has this continuous development. Developer of, of the Infer to work together with the production team. Infer is not perfect, it has many false positives, but that the production team develops, uh, reports the error and then the developer immediately tries to fix it. I don't think there is a perfect, I mean, we know there is no perfect solution, so one should go for a cocktail of solution. It's fine to have sound, but inc incomplete, incorrect solutions. And then just ultimately, like from, from the theoretical uh, perspective, okay, and I think this is actually why I'm so interested now in applications of security. In security, there is no way out to get, I mean, unless, unless of trivial properties, but quite many properties in security require first of the logic at least. Non-interference property would tell you that a user request does not in interfere with another user request. You don't know which user request you talk about, but you know there are two user requests and they should not interfere. Again, a very natural first of the property. So you have to be, what, be the community of automated reasoning, and this is actually my research is about, how can we push the boundary, what is possible in reasoning with quantifiers, well, or reasoning with first of the theory for data structures, and going beyond first of the logic. And I, I do believe that this is going to, I, I believe it's already for 10 years ago, and I still believe it for the next 10, 10 years is going to be one of the hottest topics of automated reasoning. And with that, I conclude, and I'm happy to take questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Laura. Um, I think it's really interesting also for a non-academic audience to hear what's going on in research and on what problems you're working on. So thank you really for that. And for the first question, you probably already expected, um, because we from research, we expect those questions. Um, what does it mean for existing real world programming? Uh, I, yeah, I expect this question. and. Uh, so one year ago, I, I started, so I got this ERC. I have an ERC starting grant, but it's on basic research. I can do all the crazy hard math there, you know. I, I, can, I can fail. It's good to fail. But then I have also the proof of concept, which is really about commercial, let's, can I commercialize my ideas? And it turns out it can. Actually, I, I wanted to show you. So the, these examples I showed you there, I mean, these are really come at the previous slide. Except Facebook, I don't, we don't yet work with Facebook, but we do work with Amazon, we do work together with Xertora, and we do work with Microsoft Research together. But it's not just us, okay? So, what, for instance, what happens at Amazon Web Services, so we work with Byron Cook, uh, who is the head of Amazon Research Group, and he's actually saying that at Amazon Web Services, they get a day 20 million requests for, um, uh, for automated reasoners. But it's not just vampire. It's a tree, vampire, lingling, mini sat, all kind of zoo. And you really try to come up with some kind of portfolio solver. But I try to also say in the talk, it's, it's, it's not the one solution. So it has to happen. With, first, you, you would never run an automated reasoner in a large code immediately. You would do a lot of testing. You would do a lot of abstraction before, all our, our, all our methods before, and then you start using an automated reasoner. But it is used out there. So it's, I think 10 years ago, people would be very skeptical. It was mainly Microsoft Research for, for their static device uh, verification project using automated reasoning. This has changed. It's, it is there. It is present. But it's, again, it's a, it's a zoo of many other methods. Um, can you use the automated reasoning program to verify your own code? Or yeah. where should I get started? Yeah, that's, that's a good one, actually. This is our ongoing project, which we never started. Uh, <laughs> can we actually run, run Vampire on, on, on itself? So there are approaches. There is this approach called proof-carrying code. Uh, it would be 
it would be great. I mean, we use it usually, we are academics, okay, let's put it this way. So there are some bugs, and we know there are some bugs. We fix them, we do all kind of soundness tests before we push out the first, uh, the next version. The problem is, again, it's just alone running vampire on vampire will not work. Again, you need something on top. Okay, you need many other methods that do all the abstraction, and then you would run vampire. But some of the benchmarks are actually coming from the vampire code. Um, should we start to use other programming languages that are easier to reason about, like Haskell, or should we improve the reasoners? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, if you manage to change the, the community so that we go away from imperative style programming, I mean, even teach uh, programming one at Teuvin in, in a functional programming language would be great. But I just don't see this happening very fast. So Scala would be great. It really combines functional and imperative or object oriented programming. I think for many reasons, C, C++ is there because it's fast, it's, it has all these uh, features, it's, it has a very good memory management. It would be really, I mean, it would be great to, I mean, very good, you know, it's very relative, but compared to others. Um, I would be happy to change to functional programming or, I don't know, like a, a cocktail of or a hybrid system. Uh, but... Um, Existing solutions, Z3, Lingaling, Minisat, all, I, I don't know actually about CVC4, but Lingaling, Minisat, Z3, Vampire, all, E, all written in C++. So there is a reason why. Um, the next question, let's see. Um, how does it interact with real source code or does it require manual steps to convert it, uh, the input for Vampire? Yeah. So it's, it's currently, there is no uh, live interaction. So that's actually one of the big challenge. How do you come up with the right encoding to your solver? And this, this is the experience, actually. There were examples from um, partners, one of the companies you saw on the, on the slides. I don't give the, uh, the concrete name. You get a problem from them, and they do a bit vector encoding, because they, they think it's, I mean, they are trained on propositional logic, mainly. So they know bits and bit vectors. It turns out the problem. I mean, just by encoding as a bit vector theory, you impose so many unnecessary reasoning steps on the solver. It just requires a very simple abstract encoding. And that's the real question in which theory or in which, how you encode your input problem. We try to give hints, but that's, yeah, that's, that's the thing, like how you bridge this gap between the developer and the user who gives you the problem. Okay, um, last question, and we received a lot of questions, so maybe you're here for lunch, so maybe you can ask Laura directly. Um, last question, can automated reasoning be applied for timing-based assumptions, constant time of crypto algorithms? So I don't know about the, the crypto setting yet, okay? I don't mind, but actually I worked in timing analysis, computing worst case execution times of programs. And when you do a smart contract, I think some of the ideas can be applied to, to, to compute bounds on your gas consumption. I don't know, I mean, I haven't yet tried it, but I did worst case execution time analysis. So you can do, again, but it's not alone. Think of automated reasoning as together with symbolic execution. And then try to do this loop. Sometimes the symbolic execution gives you the path that you want to automate the reasoning above. You learn from the automated reasoning input and pass the symbolic executor. Thank you, and thank you very much, Laura.